but not to be outdone by Mo Brooks, somebody from the other side of the aisle, our representative from Selma, Terry Sewell of the state of Alabama, went on Meet the Press to discuss the impeachment inquiry and everything that's going on in the Ukraine. So we'll go ahead and watch one of those clips of her right now. Have you heard enough uh, in your mind that the president essentially should be indicted for this? I, I mean, that's what an article of impeachment is. It's an indictment. It is. Um, but I can tell you that I, um, the evidence is mounting. Um, I think that... Uh, I, I think that the American people should hear uh, the testimony of, of um, Ambassador Taylor. Um, we just heard from a, a war hero, um, Mr. Venerman, re recently. And I think that it's really important that we get to the bottom of this. All right, so a couple of things there. First of all, and I wanted to point this out, she, she points out that their big star witness was a war hero. And based on what I've seen about the man's record, he is. I think war hero is an appropriate classification for that guy. But here's the thing. Being a war hero doesn't make you infallible. And what I think is hilarious is the Democrats now pivoted towards this and tried to make it out as though this guy, well, he's a war hero. Every single thing that he says must be true. We can trust everything that he says because, of course, he is a war hero. Does it give him some credibility? I guess so, but... Ultimately, it doesn't mean that he has good intentions, nor does it mean that he's going to be right on everything. Case in point. You remember that the Democrats didn't refer to when John McCain was running against President Obama. They didn't refer to him constantly as a war hero, and whenever he said something that was dumb or inaccurate, they didn't say, well, you know, he's above reproach, he's a war hero, whatever he says must be true. And what I find incredibly disingenuous is Terry Sewell and the other Democrats acting as though, well, he's a war hero. We can't, uh, we can't say anything against him. We can't be critical of him. We can't even really float the question out there. Maybe his testimony can't be trusted. Now, I'm not saying that his testimony absolutely can't be trusted. Based on what I've seen, he is a concerned citizen that had some issues with the Trump-Ukraine call, and he is perfectly within his rights. And I think that if he does feel uncomfortable about it, he would be in the wrong to not come forward and talk about it. But nonetheless, we should also not give him some kind of false sense of infallibility just because the man happens to also be a war hero. Just like we shouldn't do that with any other war hero, regardless of what side of the aisle that they may be on. And so that's one of the big takeaways. There were three big takeaways from his testimony the other day, the, the big star witness that the Democrats called. First of all, he felt uncomfortable about the call. Oh, okay, that's fine. He, he, in other words, he felt uncomfortable about it. He felt as though the president actually was asking for something that was inappropriate from the Ukrainian president. Well, that's your opinion, and I think that we ought to take it into account. But I also believe that since we have the actual transcript and we can look at it yourself, that you may have a little more expertise and experience on this stuff, but ultimately your opinion doesn't matter, at least from a legal perspective, any more than my opinion. Or any more from the opinion of some guy just walking down the street as an American citizen. So I'm not saying we just discount it, but I am saying that that's pretty subjective and weak when it comes to making a case for impeachment. The second big takeaway was that the transcript was representative of the call. That's what he said. Well, if the transcript is representative of the call, then that kind of strikes against this Democrat narrative that, oh, that's not the real call, and all the ellipses and all of the parts that were left out of it, those show the really bad, nasty stuff. No. This guy who believes that the Ukrainian call was inappropriate is still the same guy that is saying, but it's not as though they're hiding the ball with the call. That is a, a representative transcript of the call. Maybe it has an error here or there, it's missing something, but the overall theme and tone and context, they're all there. And having the actual call isn't going to make a difference in what's going on here. Now, he feels what's in the transcript is enough to make him personally uncomfortable. He does not say that there is enough for the president to get in legal, in legal trouble. And that was actually his third point, which is, I feel uncomfortable about the call, but the president didn't actually do anything illegal. 
So their big star witness made three major points, one of which was merely his opinion, and the other two actually strike against the Democrat narrative. So I do find it funny that Terry Sewell is going on Meet the Press talking about how you know eye-opening this was and how, looking at that testimony, she's so sure now that President Trump should be impeached. And I'm looking at it and saying, uh, well, the only thing that kind of works against Trump is the, guy, is the fact that this guy's opinion is that the call was inappropriate. But inappropriate is very different from illegal. And so that's something that really cuts, across, uh, cuts against that. And uh, you have to remember also, and I kind of mentioned this earlier when we were talking about Bo Brooks, even if there was a quid pro quo there, the fact that he was looking for corruption is a perfectly legitimate defense. It is a perfectly legitimate defense. Because here's the thing. Even if it was personally motivated, and to be honest, I believe that it was. I don't know if it was Trump's idea or Trump went along with it because Giuliani, uh, sorry, Rudy Giuliani suggested it. But either way, I think that it was personally motivated. And I think that Trump's idea or Giuliani's idea was, okay, well, if we do this, let's just say that the quid pro quo actually did happen. Okay, so we're going to hold back this foreign aid unless he gets to the bottom of this deal. If he gets to the bottom of what actually happened in Ukraine in the 2016 election. The issue with that, and remember that Ukraine already has arrested and convicted four men in, uh, in connection to trying to manipulate America's election. So it's perfectly reasonable to believe that that was going on in Ukraine in 2016. So with that in mind, you have to remember that even if it's personally motivated, that does not necessarily mean that Trump is acting outside of his purview as the President of the United States. Here's a great example. Let's say that you were the sheriff of a town. That is an elected office, after all. Well, as the sheriff, part of your job is to make sure that laws are not broken, and one of the laws on the books is that cocaine is illegal. Let's say the sheriff is out doing his patrols run at one night, and he sees his wife and a suspected cocaine dealer hanging out with one another and being very all over each other, and he follows them and then sees that they go and get a hotel room. So the next morning, the sheriff walks in and says, okay, I want you to investigate this guy, I want you to get the stuff on him, and I want you to bring him in. That is personally motivated, but as long as the guy actually does still have reasonable suspicion that he is a cocaine dealer, it doesn't matter because it's still the sheriff's job to bring those people in. So even if there's personal animus towards the guy, and even if the reason for him wanting his deputies to look into this was indeed because he saw the guy that was taking his wife out, you know, even then, He's still not in trouble because he was acting within the confines of the law, even if it was personally motivated. You can't say that everybody that has a personal connection to a law enforcement officer, that person automatically gets a, a free get-out-of-jail card just because they happen to do that and they shouldn't get personally involved. Like, Even if this was personally motivated, even if in the back of his mind what Trump was thinking is, I'm going to get uh, dirt on Joe Biden, as long as it's still within the national interest to get to the bottom of this matter— Still, technically, he has not abused his power because he's still doing something that the country has an interest in. And that's really the defense that should be used here and one that seems to be forgotten by Terry Sewell. What if, for example, a president decided that he was going to investigate a political rival and wiretap their phones and communication lines because he suspected that there was something foul afoot, that there was some kind of Russian collusion, let's say, between this and the president. Wasn't well, that exactly what Obama did? Now, I don't think that that was justified, and I've laid out that case many times, but whether you believe it was justified or not, most of the people on the left say, no, no, that was perfectly acceptable, that was okay, because there was a national interest in finding out whether or not this guy was indeed in bed with the Russians, which, by the way, at least with that sentence on its surface, I agree with. 
We need to find out if one of our candidates is in bed with the Russians, and if we have reasonable suspicion to believe they are, we should be investigating them. But you could also just as easily make the case that, well, Obama was politically motivated in spying on Trump. Well, yeah, maybe, but if you can prove that there was a national interest in it, and that he wasn't just doing it for the sake of getting dirt on Trump, well, then you're free and clear, and he still had the right to do it. Now, I believe that you can make a solid case for there being no reasonable, and that goes back to the case of the FISA courts, I don't think that there actually was a national interest in it. I think that it was a cooked-up, manufactured uh, reasonable doubt, as it were, for the reason they had to wiretap and spy on candidate Trump. But the point is, as long as that is there, it's funny to me that the Democrats want to play this game where, oh, no, 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 that, that was in the national interest, and whether or not there was a possibility that it was personally motivated, that just doesn't matter in that case. But here, well, there was at least the possibility that it was personally motivated, so that must be it. That's the only logical explanation for why Trump would have engaged in this. It's a complete double standard. Let's look at one other clip by Terry Sewell. To me, uh, I've seen my Republican colleagues twist themselves into a pretzel in order to defend the indefensible. Um, I think this is about right and wrong, right and wrong, and I think the American people understand right and wrong. And I think that it's important that we um, give to them, uh, let them hear for themselves the testimony. And I think that we've already been presented with a lot of testimony that has uh, been leaked or been uh, the opening statements have been presented that it has a very damning case against the president. All right, so there's a couple of things in there. Uh, first of all, she's somewhat contradicting herself, or at the very least not calling out her Democrat colleagues. I don't think that Terry Sewell is nearly powerful or influential enough to be calling these shots. But she's saying, well, there's a really good case against the president, and I think that the American people should see all of the testimony against him. Okay, I agree with that. I, Caleb Colquitt, am agreeing with you, Terry Sewell. I think that that is an appropriate response to that. The problem is she's saying, well, you know, there have been evident there has been evidence that come out that has been leaked. Well, well now wait a second. If you're in favor of us seeing all the testimony for ourselves and making our own decision, why aren't you out there beating the drum saying, let's make this public? Let's keep it out there in the open. Now, granted, in the past week, the Democrats have been a little bit better about that. But at the time of Terry Sewell making this comment, and frankly, still to some degree, a lot of this has actually been handled behind closed doors, and then they're strategically leaking only the details that makes their side look good. That's not the way this is supposed to work. You can't just say, well, there's a really good case against the guy, and if you want a good case for it, look at the strategically leaked evidence that we specifically put out there to make him look as though there is a case for this guy being guilty. No, let's look at the full thing and look at everything in context and then make a decision. Let's not make a decision based on the little tidbits that have leaked out into the press over the weeks that people like Adam Schiff have strategically just placed breadcrumbs for the media to find. Let's make this public and out in the open. I'm fine with that. What I'm not okay with is Terry Sewell acting as though, well, that's really all you need. And acting as though, well, I'm the one that's for transparency. I'm the champion. I think that the American people should see all of it. But, you know, they have really seen all of it because they're getting the bits that the Democrats have been leaking out. Um, No, that's not good enough. I want it to be transparent, too. But Terry Sewell is saying, well, let's, let's opt for transparency and then saying, well, you really have all that you need to know because we're strategically just leaking those things out there for you. Mm, you got to hold one standard to the other. Now, if Terry Sewell had gone on and said, you know what, it's not right that the Democrats are keeping so much of this behind locked doors. I think that it should be out in the open. Then I give her a hand on that. And I would have at least respected her courage for doing so, but of course, she is not going to do that. Because I, I, I find this really important. I find this really important to the central theme of, of this entire story. I want you to notice something. The Democrats are strategically leaking information and trying to keep as much of this behind closed doors as possible. They want to keep all the, the names out of the public eye, and they just want to spoon-feed you little details bit by bit that make their side look good. What is just about everybody on the right saying to you? 
go read the transcript, go read the original whistleblower uh, complaint, look at everything that you can. Which one is more likely to be the side that's trying to cover something up? Is it the people that are saying, go read the original documents and decide for yourself? Or is it the people that are saying, no, 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 here's a little bit of information. Okay, here's a little bit more information. And we want you to get all of that through the filter of the media who is on our side. Out of those two scenarios, who is more likely to be the one that's trying to hide the ball from you? That's the question you need to ask yourself. Who is more twisting themselves into a pretzel, to use Terry Sewell's words, to try to give you the spoon-fed narrative that they want you to have? That's the difference in what we're talking about right here. If the transcript were so damaging, if the raw data were so damaging, and it was so bad, and it was so, you know, to use Terry Sewell's uh, phraseology there, if it were such damning evidence, then why did Adam Schiff have to make it up? If it were so bad, and it was so obvious that Trump was engaged in criminal activity, well, then why did Terry Sewell, or sorry, why did Adam Schiff had to make up a fictitious reading of it just to make it make sense? Just to make it make sense that his side was trying to make this case? Why is that? That's the question that every single person should be asking right now. Hey, to make sure you get all the updates, you need to go ahead and subscribe and click that little notification bell down there. That gets you a notification every time I post a new Bible lesson or political commentary. Now, I'm not saying that if you don't subscribe, it's because you hate America and Jesus, but I can't think of any other reason you wouldn't subscribe.